This morning, we're privileged to have Rear Admiral Scott Guyberson, the Acting Surgeon General, Acting Deputy Surgeon General, sorry, I almost promoted you, <coughs> who's going to talk to us a little bit on the, his lessons that he's learned from the front lines, the battle against an invisible enemy, namely Ebola. So Admiral Giberson, if you'd care to come on up. Okay, thank you very much. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm going to go this side because there's more people. I don't, no offense, Colonel Zarnick. So good morning, everyone. So real quick survey here. How many people here are from the Department of Defense? Okay. How about any other U.S. Department, like Department of Health and Human Services? State Department? Okay. Inter that's next. Internationals? Good to have you all. Thank you very much. I worked with a lot of your colleagues over there, I'm sure. So, Well, it's good to be here. And just so everybody knows, my temperature is 97.6 today. I'm done with my 21-day period, so we're all good. I was not quarantined. However, I did active monitoring. I'll tell you one way I found out that you can get through the lines real quickly in the airport. You stick a thermometer in your mouth. And then you pull it out and say, oh, my goodness. And then the crowd is just sparked. <laughs> anyway, so a uh, little bit about the lessons from the front lines. I want to set this up today with a, a very interactive session. I'll get through the slides well before my time is up. I think I have an hour to talk, which is very long, and you'll all be asleep again by that time. So please ask questions at the end, and, and I want to know uh, what you want to know. And, and I, I can answer a lot of questions but I won't be able to present it all in the slide set. So please feel free. There's a lot of activity out there. There's a lot of partnerships. There's a lot of lessons learned. They're not all on these slides, so please ask at will. So let's get through these slides. So obviously the, the first pictures, I just wanted you to remember how important this response is and remember the global impact and to think about the, the criticality of what we're about to do and, and encounter. You have obviously the pictures here that are reminiscent of everything that we're doing before this time and now everything moving forward is about patient care, it's about patient lives, it's about the public health of multiple populations across the globe. And it starts even with children. I won't talk too much about my experience unless you ask questions about it, but in the hot zone, my first four patients were all under the age of seven. They were all orphans because they had no parents, they lost them to Ebola. So very serious situation we have. The picture on the right is actually our first patient in the Monrovia Medical Unit, which is run by the U.S. Public Health Service and built by the Department of Defense and supplied by the Department of Defense. So I think this is the slide. There we go. Did I shut it off? No. <laughs> there you go. Okay, sorry about that. Now I know how to use this thing. It's a little different. It looks like a walkie-talkie. That's old school. So West African Ebola outbreak, everything in our mission starts with a strategy. We have a U.S. government strategy. The U.S. government strategy is set by the president. Ebola epidemic in West Africa and the humanitarian crisis there is a top national security crisis for the United States. So that goes into a lot of missions, whether it's the Department of Defense, the U.S. Public Health Service, the Department of Homeland Security, Health and Human Services, State Department, we're all involved in this international response. But from the U.S. strategy, that's very important. The strategy was predicated on four things. Stop the, Ebola, the, stop the spread of the Ebola epidemic at the source in West Africa. Stop the second order impacts, which is the economy, the people, the, the people of West Africa, how they interact, their social welfare and well-being, uh, the impact on the region. The third thing is the engaging, engaging and coordinating all the stakeholders on a broader global health audience. And the fourth is fortifying global health security infrastructure in the region. Now all these things fit into our mission because this does have a U.S. Public Health Service focus. The U.S. Public Health Service is my uniform service. Surgeon General Admiral Lushniak here, Acting Surgeon General. 
It's part of the Department of Health and Human Services, not part of the Department of Defense, for those of you that aren't aware of the U.S. Public Health Service. We're the Commission Corps. We've been in, in existence for over 200 years. And our mission is to protect, promote, and advance the health and safety of the nation. So when you talk about protecting the health, that obviously involves infectious pathogens. Why deploy us? So we're a very small entity in the Department of Health and Human Services. We're about 7,000 officers. We have no enlisted ranks. We're all medical and public health professionals. So very focused on public health and the only uniformed service solely focused on public health in, around, the, around the globe, actually. So we, it directly speaks to our mission, which has a focus on health, which is pretty obvious that we're involved with it. Historical context, we've always been enveloped and I used enveloped as a virology term here, pun intended. We've always been enveloped in infectious pathogens and disease. We were involved in the eradication of smallpox and the work on polio eradication as well. We've done the Spanish flu in the 1918s. We've done discovery of disease like cholera. We have historical ties to just about every major infectious pathogen that there is. So we have a long history of that. So why not Ebola? Because that certainly fits within our mission and portfolio. The skill sets, we have 11 different health disciplines from physicians and nurses and pharmacists to engineers and environmental health officers and veterinarians. So it made sense that this small focused unit of a uniform service was able to deploy overseas as a US government asset and work with all the collaborators to do the job. The uniform service that understands the IMS, the incident management system, we understand the chain of command. We've been deployed many, many times, hundreds of times in, in the US domestically for hurricane response, for other types of response, including hurricanes Katrina and Rita, to the World Trade Center event, to the anthrax attacks afterwards. Very familiar and comfortable with working in a multi-sectoral response environment, in a multi-uniform response environment, and obviously, dealing with an infectious pathogen, we have the skill sets and the active practitioners to address it. The volunteer pool, just so you know, when we put out a call, we can deploy people actively, much like the DOD, say, you must go. However, we asked for the skill sets of our officers first and said, you know, who has experience in this specific area? Who would like to go? Who would volunteer? Within 48 hours, we had over a fourth of our entire service volunteer to go. That's pretty good. Our problem was filtering it down to get the right people over there at the right skill sets and the right timing and the approvals from their supervisors to go. So we can deploy for extended periods, much like DOD, however, not quite as long. We're able to deploy from our agencies, our home agencies overseas, both domestic and abroad deployment. And we can extend for multiple months at a time if needed. Cultural fluency, this is something that is sometimes taught. However, for us, it's experiential. Mostly, we work with underserved and vulnerable populations in the United States. So we work in the Federal Bureau of Prisons. We work in the American Indian Alaska Native Reservations. We work with immigration services and provide direct patient care. So our skill sets with cultural fluency are very adept. And actually, the term cultural fluency is something that came from my work with the American Indian Alaska Native populations. You'll hear the terms cultural sensitivity or cultural competence. If you extend that out and evolve that, it's actually culturally, cultural fluency. So we use that term a lot. Collaborative in nature. So this is the joke I always use when I talk to my friends at DOD. I say, you know, lack of resources facilitates a collaborative spirit. So we are not resourced as well as other uniform services just because we're small. We've come from a department that is not necessarily an operational department, but a policy writing department or a policy driven department health and human services. So we don't have many resources and we are rely on and have to collaborate with many other partners. So that collaborative spirit helps in a response environment as you might expect. And our civil, civil military foundation. So in the other uniform services, they have people specifically that are civ mil, civ mil units, civil military units. They get along better with the military and the civilians. You know, it's sort of that diplomacy bridge. That's built in in our entire careers. We work side by side with civilians across the department and across multiple departments, which gives us a sort of advantage in ways that our folks know how to work with both people in uniform, people from other countries, 
and people that are just from the communities, which is our day-to-day -day jobs. So there's some of the reasons I would say, well, why would you deploy the U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps? Here's the overall USG response picture. Obviously, we filter into the unmirror response, United Nations mission for emergency Ebola response. And this is the first time ever, as you probably already know, especially our international friends, that the UN has created an emergency response for a specific disaster or crisis. So this Ebola crisis, largest in history, obviously, was one that they decided to do the UN mission for emergency response on Ebola, UNMIR. We all fill and support UNMIR. Within UNMIR, they work with the host agency, the host governments, and they also work with multiple partners across the globe to organize this response. WHO is their strategic consult. So the WHO would provide strategy for UNMIR, and we all work together in country to get it done. The US strategy, when we were over there in Liberia, and that's where I was mostly, but it's Sierra Leone, Guinea, we supported and we're in support of the chief of mission, which is the US Embassy, COM, and United States Agency for International Development, USAID, and the DART team, which is the Disaster Assistance Response Team. They're in country, the DART team, and they work with all three of, or four or five of the West African countries that were affected. So all of the three big circles around the edge support and are in support of USAID and the chief of mission for the US government. Obviously the big entity, resources, personnel, you know, supplies, the Department of Defense, teaching, training, the Department of Defense up there with AFRICOM as their lead in command in Liberia and in West Africa was there with us. The CDC obviously has tons of subject matter expertise. Anybody here from CDC? Well, they must be all over in Liberia, so, okay. Centers for Disease Control. Everybody's familiar with Centers for Disease Control. They have a lot of subject matter expertise on epidemiology, on training, on infection control, on the spread, uh, control of spread of outbreaks. So they were there in, in mass. And then obviously from the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Health and the Office of the Surgeon General, our Commission Corps of the United States Public Health Service. So every time we went to a meeting there, if you looked at the heads of state, figuratively, you had the, the ambassador, you had the DART lead, you had the DOD lead, the PHS lead, and the CDC lead. And there was five or six people in a room and we'd all discuss the next steps in country. So that's sort of the makeup of the group operationally. So for us, there were a lot of milestones in the public health service and, and it, it does filter into the bigger response, but I could talk to you more about our piece as well as everybody else's. So, it began in December because it really didn't begin with our deployment in October to provide direct patient care. It started with the Centers for Disease Control. Centers for Disease Control were asked to respond all the way in the late 2013. And in 2013, they'd started to deploy people, epidemiologists, uh, epidemiology uh, uh, you know, specialties that we call EIS officers. Uh, they were deployed over and many of them were actually public health service officers, but they were doing a CDC mission, which is different. That's their day-to-day -day job. The CDC mission is their day-to-day -day job, and they were deployed by CDC overseas. They started to work on this mission, and as the outbreak spread and as it got bigger, other partners got involved. So USAID got involved as, a, as HHS was asked to participate, which is our mother, our department, and they were asked, could we participate? Could the core be used as an asset? Well, this is one of the first times that we've been asked to do this type of a response in an international setting where we would be an independent entity, not subordinate to another entity like the Department of Defense, which is also possible, not subordinate to ASPR, which is the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response. This is an independent uniform service functioning with its own skill sets as an asset of the US government deployed in a foreign land We've done other international response. We've done Haiti. We've been on tsunamis in Indonesia. But we've worked very closely with the Department of Defense or been on their ships or you know, been subordinate to their operations. So this was a little bit different for us. So the proposal was made that we could function in multiple roles. It wasn't just direct patient care. We have health educators. We have health communicators. We have epidemiologists. We have subject matter experts. So all of those roles that we could have provided were proposed, including and inclusive of direct patient care. 
in August and September, we had the opportunity to confirm our authorities. And because it wasn't frequent, frequent that actually any of our uniformed services did something quite like this, we make, made sure that we had all the authorities to do so. And you know how it's sometimes cumbersome to go through Office of General Counsel. How many people here are lawyers? I don't have any lawyers here. That's great. Okay. No offense to lawyers. I like lawyers. Anyway, they made sure that we had the authorities to do this. And our secretary had the ability to deploy our corps, which she does frequently domestically, but overseas for this type of response to provide direct patient care in a foreign country. We had to have bilateral agreements done for liability issues, which I can answer questions about. So all these types of things had to be discussed, confirmed. They were done. This is, our, our, this is in code, Title 42, and it just describes some of the things that we were able to accomplish at the time. So we can respond both foreign and domestic. We can respond to an urgent or emergency public health need, and it's determined by our secretary. Our secretary can decide if it's a humanitarian crisis or if it's a need and she could deploy us. It was Secretary Burwell at the time. And in 204C, the pay comes from our home agencies. So if I work for the Centers for Disease Control or the Indian Health Service or the Bureau of Prisons, it becomes part of their agency mission when we're deployed. So that makes it easy for moving officers around and getting them deployed wherever they're needed. So those things are confirmed. A couple more. Our secretary asked if the Corps had the capacity to staff a hospital. So could we do direct patient care? The answer was yes. The activation and deployment memo was signed by Secretary Burwell, and the White House confirmed that we would deploy commissioned officers to fill a 25-bed hospital. One of the crowning moments for us, and this was the first of six times that the President of the United States mentioned the U.S. Public Health Service of the Commission Corps. For those of you who are used to being mentioned by the President of the United States, that's very different for us. We can't recall, and I talked to Admiral Lushniak and some of our senior leadership, we can't recall a time where the president has mentioned us so much, or, or at all, for the most part, specifically as the U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps. So this was President Obama at the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta when he was talking, and there's actually some of the shadows in the left there are our officers in uniform, uh, and he was talking with Secretary Burwell and Dr. Frieden about the deployment of our Corps and the use of us as an asset. So very proud of that moment at the time. And, uh, and since that point in time, we've, we've actually spoken with him and Admiral Lushniak and a few others have gotten to see him and meet him a few times. I myself actually got a phone call on my cell phone from President Obama, which was uh, probably one of the highlights of my career. So uh, I could say he's very involved and very supportive of this mission. Our mission task here, which was further defined said that we were going to staff a 25-bed hospital, but it was going to be for Ebola treatment care. So in other words, it wasn't going to be filling another gap, which is non-Ebola-related care, but our specific mission was to focus on Ebola-related care. I'm going to talk about the uniqueness of this mission because sometimes it's lost in the shuffle when we talk about all the U.S. government response. There are people doing many, many roles in Liberia, in West Africa, Sierra Leone. But there is only one U.S. government asset that's providing direct patient care. And that's the members of our 70-person team in the U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps. That doesn't mean that we would even exist or have the even potential to do it if we didn't have 100 partners and massive support from the Department of Defense and the Centers for Disease Control and USAID. However, the fact is we're the only ones providing direct patient care. So we do have now some organic expertise, if you will, in actually providing direct patient care. That is going to be unique for the U.S. government, and we're learning as we go, to tell you the truth. But we did take the requisite training, and we added on even further training, training with some of the experts in the world, like MSF and International Medical Corps, IMC. I'll describe that in a little bit. So on the left, you see the first team deployed, our Team 1. 70, 65 officers there probably uh, of the U.S. Public Health Service in our ODU blue, which is the Coast Guard's operational duty uniform, which we as a sea service, the Coast Guard, NOAA, and the U.S. Public Health Service use the blue uniforms as their operational uniforms, just in case you see the, the men in blue or the, or the term men in blue anywhere, that's uh, probably us or the Coast Guard. On the right there you see our second patient admitted to the MMU. Uh, who I have a picture of later when he's cured. 
So strategic planning, when you in, get involved in something like this, obviously some of it is new, some of it is going to be learned as you go, and some of it is normal to a process of strategic planning for a deployment. So we can see some of the things here. We had to develop our C2, which is command and control. We had to have our command and control established. They had to establish goals and objectives. That's fairly simple. Happens in all responses. Interagency coordination with a focus on deployment requirements. Basic to response. Force protection, force health protection, a top priority for us. However, even more so important in this situation, because of the risk of providing direct patient care, there is a whole new platform to think about and consider for force health protection. Were we a little bit anxious about doing this? Absolutely. When the call came out to say, hey, U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps, can you do this? Can you provide direct patient care in country? There was a lot of discussion. Did we have the capacity? Yes. But there is no way you're going to have global impact unless you accept risk. You know that from war, from other response. We felt that it was our mission. We felt that we were the best asset to utilize. We accepted the risk. We trained to mitigate the risk. And we're now succeeding in the mission. So yes, there was absolutely anxiety before we left. And the unknown is even worse than once you're over there and you're actually working in the environment. It's much better. So the force protection, force health, force health protection situation was uh, definitely in our strategic planning. Wraparound services. So we had to think about air mobilization. Remember, we don't have a lot of assets in our core. No toys, no helicopters, no planes, no boats. So we have to rely on our sister services and others to support this mission. So air mobilization, food, supplies, life support, sustainment of services, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Even the facility itself which is not a PHS facility, it's a DOD facility, which I'll talk about. Level of care, there were all kinds of questions about, well, should we be providing Ebola-related care or non-Ebola-related care, or both? Or could you do both in the same facility? Never before had this type of a unit been built for this purpose. So we had to think about all those things in our strategic planning. At what point does the level of care stop? What's the expectation? Is the expectation to take the person through their course of the disease if they're a Liberian national, possibly. If they're an American, maybe we stabilize for Aerovac. So all these things were part of the strategic planning and they were all unknowns. Obviously the level of care, because the facility potentially was capable of doing higher level care, we had to, feel, we had to figure out if that was operationally relevant in country, in the field, if it was possible with Ebola related care. We had something else. Uh, EMEDS, which is an Expeditionary Medical Support Unit. It's a DOD unit that the DOD could tell you a lot more about than I can what it's normally used for, trauma-related care, you know, in wartime or in a need of, uh, for that type of mission. However, this was not a trauma-related mission. This was not something that was non-Ebola-related care. This was specifically for an infectious pathogen. So we had challenges with that, which we worked out with the DOD, and I'll have a little anecdotal story about that, I'll tell you. Uh, later on. So eligibility, what pool of population do we see? Is it augmentive to all the other ETUs that were being built or is it for a specific purpose? So our specific purpose for this medical unit was healthcare providers, both Liberian national healthcare providers and international healthcare providers. The definition that was given to us by the National Security Council was more broad than what you would think of as a traditional healthcare provider. What it ends up becoming is a healthcare responder. So we have a priority for healthcare providers, meaning the typical traditional physician, physician assistant, nurse, pharmacist, healthcare worker. But there's expanding concentric circles of who we can provide care to. So if the beds are filled up with that pool, that's where it stops. However, the beds are not full and we can take more. So we take assistance at the ETU. So if there's a nursing assistant, if there's a uh, ambulance driver, if there is a administrative person working in the ETU that has no healthcare background, they're a healthcare responder in the ETU in, a, in harm's way, they become infected with Ebola, Ebola they, could be, they could be seen at our facility. So it's really healthcare responder 
as our pool of population. It involves all international healthcare workers and responders, same definition. So if you have MSF there, all their providers are covered, but so are all their staff, even if it's an incinerator worker, even if it's a burial service, whatever it may be, if they're there for response for Ebola, they have eligibility in our facility. So that came through from the National Security Council from the White House. Not our job to decide that. That's in a pay grade much higher than mine. However, we operationalized it on the ground with the Ministry of Health from Liberia and the ambassador, the U.S. ambassador to Liberia. Liability. Obviously, if you're going to provide direct patient care in a foreign country, there has to be liability issues solved. So the strategic planning for liability issues was extensive through Office of General Counsel. There are two types of things that we go through. We go through a bilateral country-to-country -country agreement, U.S. government to Liberian government, and or a status of forces agreement, which is called SOFA, and that's much more akin to a uniform services agreement like the Department of Defense would have with Liberia. But none of them were specific enough to cover what our folks were about to do, to provide direct patient care to patients with Ebola in country. So we had to have a new bilateral agreement between Liberia and the U.S. government. So that was done and completed in order to do this mission. Training. We're spending a little bit extra time on this slide because this, the strategic planning was really specifically my mission as, as the lead for the Ebola response for the Corps. My mission was to make sure it went from zero to opening our doors to see patients. So all these strategic planning points happened before it actually opened or had the capacity to see a patient, I should say, uh, 7 November, which is the day that we saw our, our, we were able to take our first patient. So Ella, liability uh, training. Uh, training, we had two types of training. So there's the phase one or phase two training, which includes the didactic work, your virology, all the, the science behind the Ebola. You also have your ETU setting, which is your uh, PPE, your personal protective equipment, with every, everybody is familiar with the training on PPE, the training on a mock ETU. So, getting in a setting where it's almost like an ETU, but without the patients with Ebola. So, you have all that training done beforehand. You have it done at the Centers for Disease Control. However, we added on another piece when we were in country. Once we were in country, we established a partnership with some of the clinics that were already up and running, like MSF and IMC, International Medical Corps. And we said, we, we're, our folks are not done training yet. We got the phase one and phase two training in Atlanta. We come in country. We want to be in country, in a clinic, shadowing a provider who's already providing direct patient care. So we made our clinicians, the ones that will be providing direct patient care, go for another three to five days in a clinic in Liberia with patients that had Ebola. So that was called our hot zone training. And that worked out very well for us, we believe, uh, in the long run to really get those providers conditioned to what they were about to encounter when they were working independently, not under the supervision of someone else. Much like a residency, only it was pretty condensed and it was pretty uh, intense to put them in that situation. I did have the opportunity to do one day of hot zone training because I had experience what I was about to put my providers in as well. So. Uh, I was able to, as a clinician, suit up, go into MSF, the, the largest clinic in Liberia with, at the time, 150 confirmed patients in the confirmed ward, and it was quite an experience, very surreal. And like I said, the first four patients we saw were under the age of seven years old, so it is certainly an eye-opener when you do that. However, after a couple of days, our providers got more comfortable. They felt very good about opening our clinic and seeing patients. Overall funding and funding for immediate operations and planning. So resource, fiscal resources are always a challenge. The speed with which you get those fiscal resources in a disaster is always a challenge because this is a very different type of a response. Unlike CDC or the Department of Defense, we did not have any immediate funding to utilize for this type of a response. So it was a challenge initially getting everything planned, getting our folks trained, getting our folks overseas, and working in this environment to plan the opening of this new facility. Long-term strategies, very similar to what you'd always see. Uh, steps for in-country capacity building. How are we going to transition this MMU? That's still under discussion. We will hand it over. How is it handed over? At what time is it handed over? Who is it handed over to? All those questions still remain, but they're in discussions at the strategic level. Measurement of the impact, lessons learned, and of course the resources to do this again. It's our command infrastructure. The only thing I really want you to focus on in this is the green is the people who are actually in Liberia. The blue is the people who 
are the continuity of the operations who stay consistent no matter who's in Liberia. And they change every couple of months. The blue remains sort of static. So we had to define our responsibilities. So let me give you, a, this is the 50,000 foot level of what we're doing. Our three big partners for the U.S. government response were the DOD, the Public Health Service, and the CDC. Our roles were pretty easy. It was direct patient care. That was our main mission. The second was to deploy an ADVON team. That was our mission was to start the partnerships in country from a blank slate and open this facility and orchestrate with the stakeholders. There's a typo there. It should be stakeholders. So orchestrate this entire process. Now, we're used to collaborating, like I said. So it's one of the skill sets that hopefully we have and we're a little bit more experienced at going from having not many resources to opening up this clinic, which needed a lot of resources. The Centers for Disease Control were the subject matter experts, and they also provided our training. And we, as we know, they have a, a vast amount of experience in epidemiology. And finally, our DOD partners, who I'm very glad to see, one of my friends here from Liberia, Dr. Uh, Colonel Zarnick, Dr. Zarnick, uh, from Liberia, he and I were together there. We were actually on a CNN interview together, so we shared the stage a few times together, and uh, uh, it was my privilege to do so. But we both went through this together. So the DOD provided all of our life support for our deployed officers. They continue to do so. Uh, they were able to build the entire MMU infrastructure, and different branches of the DOD helped us with different parts of this. This is just the broad stroke of DOD. And the supplies for the MMU. A constant supply chain for the MMU. The PPE, all of the medications, all of the supplies that we utilize. What's not here is the other DOD still has more missions. This is relevant to our mission at the MMU. The DOD still does in-country training, capacity building, transport, all the other missions that they have, but this is relevant to what we were utilizing in collaboration with the DOD for. So our response goal is establish and maintain an operationally relevant and functional 25-bed Ebola treatment unit facility. One goal, a lot of complexities behind that. Second goal, ensure force protection, force health protection. My mission and my men. I have got to make sure our folks, 100% of them, both men and women, come back healthy and safe. That's actually my number one priority. Third is deliver innovative, resilient, sustainable officers. So we talk about force resilience, force fitness. Have to have it. We set in play many, many strategies to make this work. Our family support network. So we take care of the folks behaviorally before they go. We take care of them while they're out there, mental and behavioral and physical health. And when they return, we do the same. Not just debriefing, but following them, offering them services, behavioral health counseling, much what you'd expect with a Department of Defense type response in war, with PTSD, with whatever type of response you have. There are going to be those issues with this type of response. They will see death. They will experience their own personal anxiety if, if they have a high risk exposure or low risk exposure. There's a lot of anxiety involved in this type of a mission. <clears throat> and the fear of the unknown. I used that in the title of this report. There's really nothing to be said further other than when you have an unknown and unseen enemy, it makes it a lot different dynamic. We see that in disaster response all the time. We saw it with the difference between the World Trade Center in 9-11 and in 10-11 when we had the anthrax attacks. Tremendously different disaster dynamics. One had fear. One had ongoing insidious progression of disease which we could not track. Very difficult. Same situation here. A lot of a fear, a lot of anxiety. A lot of emotion changes the dynamic of how you take care of your troops and how they take care of their, the people they're taking care of. Align the goals and support U.S. government and department strategy. And that's the overall department strategy we had. <clears throat> so we created a coordination dashboard. Some of the strategic topics that I just mentioned, this is just a graphic just to show you how we tracked it. Very simple, one slide. When you get... When you're the commanding officer of a deployment and you have to report to somebody very high up, three stars, four stars, you get two slides in four minutes. You got to tell them everything that's going on. The easiest way to do it is something like this with a dashboard. It says, yep, we started off all red. It's a red, green, red, yellow, green type scenario. So red would be we have nothing done with it. We have a lot to work. Yellow's in progress, still getting there, but not done yet. Green is good to go. 
So as you can see, we updated them every week. And as you can see, it started to turn more green. Now I stopped on the 8th of November. I came back. My predecessor, or my successor, picked it up and keeps marking out. Hopefully they're all green now, completely green. But this is just a good way to monitor our progress. So now we get to the point of useful lessons. There's too many to put on a slide. When we have our hot wash, I'm sure it'll be a long hot wash. I say useful lessons. What I usually say is lessons observed. Everybody knows the difference between lessons observed and lessons learned. I don't think we have lessons learned quite yet. We certainly have a lot of lessons observed. This is the first lesson I observe. This says crap happens. Okay, I don't know if you can see that over there in the corner. But this was my first, I didn't even get there yet. I missed the plane by 10 minutes. We were laid over for three days. There was not a lot of flights going into Liberia at the time. As a matter of fact, the uh, terminal was pretty much empty when it, it said Africa, West Africa at the terminal title. And there was three people in there, the three officers that I had with me. So it was a pretty vacant terminal at the time. They were, I remember getting escorted by three or four different um, you know, people that help you check your bags in and things like that because there was nobody else at the terminal. So they all came to see why we were going to West Africa at the time. It was about the same time when the CDC was predicting that there would be a million cases in the next you know, four weeks or something like that. So it was a lot of anxiety at the time that we were going over there. So we were laid over for three days. We were very anxious to get there. We were just really trying to do whiteboard meetings and telephone, telephone conference calls waiting to get there. But it already set, your, set the stage for the type of situation that you're going to have. You've got to be flexible. You have to be able to adapt. These are our officers. These are physicians, nurses. I see them cutting wood. I saw DOD physicians, epidemiologists doing the same. You have to do what's necessary. Sometimes the Navy CBs aren't on hand to do all the building, and we have to do something immediately. You've got to get it done yourself. I learned things about generators I never knew. I learned things about building I never knew, flooring, infection control, everything you could think of. It's how you get the job done in country. Everybody knows there's operational realities. If we were to sit back and say, I don't do that. I'm a physician or I'm a pharmacist or I'm a nurse. The job's not going to get done. So you roll up your sleeves, get the job done. So the first lesson I learned was the fact that resilience must be fundamental to your character. Resilience from the standpoint of flexibility. Resilience from the standpoint of accepting duties that may not be in your normal skill set. Resilience being you got to get the job done no matter what. And you can't count on anybody else to do it. Sometimes that doesn't work, sometimes it does. In this situation, in this environment, where it's very hard to get supplies in, where it's very hard to do things quickly, is the best resource I could have was resilience. I teach with images because you probably won't remember much I say. Hopefully you'll remember some of the pictures. Our officers at the bottom, when I say I think about my mission and my men and my women over there, very important to keep this in mind. I have to take care of the people who would take care of the patients. Southwest Airlines motto, right? We take care of you, you take care of the people, the customer. On the right here, I have my chief medical officer, Captain Paul Reed. Captain Reed doesn't have to do some of the things he did when he was over there, but he did them. He was the first patient, mock patient, for all the nurses and all the other physicians that were drawing blood. So we were running practice. We were running our procedures before the clinic opened. So this was the day before the clinic opened. And Paul and I had the experience or the chance to say, hey, take our blood. So we're going to go in the hot zone, which, will be, which would have been our hot zone when patients arrived. The nurses geared up in their full PPE. First time ever, we drew blood and set up IVs for us in the MMU. It's a great experience. It was a little bit more than a mock drill, though, because both Paul and I were in the hot zone. And technically, at that time, we were still in the incubation period for potential Ebola infection. So the nurses had to take it very seriously. So we were treated as if we had contaminated blood. They deconned. They did everything as if we were symptomatic patients, although we were asymptomatic. So a little bit different, a little level up. Captain Reed did not have to do that, but he was the first one to volunteer. We followed suit and did it with him and provided patients. The one thing you can't see here is he actually has food in his mouth. And as the nurses were taking the blood, he actually vomited on the nurses purposefully to train them to not react, to train them 
to continue to focus on what they're doing, to be deliberate in their movements, to utilize the training that they got at the CDC and the training they got in the hot zone, to actualize that in practice while we were there. So I had Gatorade in my mouth and he had food in his mouth and we gave them a little surprise. But it worked and it sort of sets the stage in their mind as they're practicing to be very deliberate, very cautious in their movements. Last picture at the top left, can't forget why we're there. It's for the Republic of Liberia. The mission was for the people of West Africa. It's to help them. Yes, it's to protect our homeland. Yes, it's for the United States. It's containing and controlling the spread of Ebola in West Africa at its source. But we were there to take care of people. So the second lesson I learned was remember why you are there. A lot of times we think siloed with our agency mission or our department's mission. But we have to realize the real reason we're there is for someone else, not ourselves. Not for our department, not for our mission, not for our agency, not for our uniform service but for the global mission, the global public health impact. Different groups here. Top, it's pretty amazing to see a group like that build the facility that it built. So what I really want to try to highlight there is not the fact that I stick out like a sore thumb with a blue uniform on, but the fact that there's Navy Seabees, which is the US Navy. There's Army Corps of Engineers, it's Army. There's Air Force 633rd, which built the MMU that came over in the off-the-shelf EMEDS unit. There's also USAID over here on the far right. And I think in the back there, there's an MSF expert. So you had six or seven entities, three branches of the Uniform Service, the US Public Health Service, all in the same picture, because you know what? We were there every day together, working to make this unit happen. On the bottom left, you see an expert from WHO. He's a physician in the plaid shirt, short sleeve there named Shevin Jacob, probably one of the best clinicians that we could possibly go to out there who has taken care of many, many, many patients with Ebola. He's in West Africa right now, he's in Uganda. Very willing to come forth from WHO and provide his expertise on clinical management of patients. Colonel Zarnick, I remember we worked a lot together with Shevin. Great guy, great doc, and helped us out a lot with his expertise. And on the bottom right there, you see the DART team. Can't do anything without the DART team. How many USAID folks we have here? Any USAID? They're busy too, so they're already over in country. But a great team to work with. The DART team had a liaison for each of the services. So they had the military liaison for the Department of Defense. They had a public health service liaison so that we could communicate with the DART team and the USAID folks. As we were both in support of them, it was pretty easy, easy to see their value and, and their importance in this response. So collaboration is key. Sometimes we have a lot of resources. Sometimes we have our own mission. Sometimes we're less collaborative than we need to be. In this situation, I felt that there is very good collaboration. There's always small little discussions that go on. We'll call them arguments. But for the most part, we were all there for one mission. We were all there collaboratively. We worked together. We saw people break down bridges that maybe prior uh, existed previously, all for the end point which was to care for the people in Liberia. Challenges, yes, we had some. The DOD facility, here, you know, if you think about this premise, you could see why we had challenges. So as a DOD facility staffed by our US Public Health Service Corps, two different departments in the United States government, with a dangerous pathogen in an international environment with forced health threats and things that we've never experienced in the history of our responses ever before. We had about 30 days to fix it. So yes, there were challenges. Our department funds the salaries of our officers. Other than that, we have no resources. We have to rely on somebody else for all the resources. So to get that through the works, not easy. In a short period of time, less easy. High risk and high visibility. There is an inherent risk. When you have a viral disease where the case fatality rate is over 60%, over 50% with treatment in country. That was the best rate at the time. The best case fatality rate at the time was 50%. We don't know what our case fatality rate was gonna end up being. So yes, there was high risk. It's an infectious pathogen that you can't see. High visibility, yes. When you're the only US government asset providing direct patient care, there's a lot of people looking over your shoulder. 
So there was a lot of calls I got from a lot of high-level people wondering how we were doing and if we were going to pull this off. Sir, no offense, you were doing great. Admiral Lushnag was not looking over my shoulder as closely as other people because he knew he had confidence and trust in us that we would get the job done, right? It's a very, very anxious-filled situation, anxiety-filled situation. We got the job done. We're getting it done right now. And finally, in-country operational realities. So very hard to build an Emory-like facility in the field in Liberia. The expectation was not that we would provide trauma-related care or intensive care, meaning life-sustaining care, if a patient came in in advanced disease with Ebola. Very different set of situations operationally versus a situation you may have for one single patient here in the United States in a facility like an Emory or a Nebraska or a, uh, another center with different capabilities like NIH. So the operational realities combined with the need to do, provide high-level care in a tight timeline with multiple chains of communications to the top people, meaning the leads of DOD, the leads of the HHS, the leads of the US government, including the president, did provide some challenges. So we had some tumultuous waters, rough waters ahead. And since we're a sea service, we have to figure out how to get to the calm waters. So the courses of action we took, I'm gonna give you one example of something that was worked through, collaborated on, it's anecdotal, it was successful. It was the challenge to go from an expeditionary medical support unit, an EMEDS unit for trauma care in the Department of Defense, to an Ebola treatment unit or facility. So the challenge is the EMEDS is an off-the-shelf DOD asset. I can't speak with tremendous expertise to what the EMEDS can do, but I was very familiar with it at the time when I reviewed it with the Air Force and with the Army and with the, you know, the engineers, what it could do, what its capacity was, what the off-the-shelf pallets came supplied with. I didn't need a dental clinic. I didn't need a PT, physical therapy. I didn't need high-level trauma care or an emergency room. But what I did need was infection control setup. I needed the ability to decontaminate. I needed the ability to see multiple patients that had to be potentially isolated. All these challenges were not normally configured in an EMEDS. The EMEDS was in the XORD, the executive orders. So the DOD gets executive orders. It's set in stone. It goes. If they say send an EMEDS, they will send an EMEDS. It's the right thing to do. However, the DOD and we, the Public Health Service, both knew that we needed an Ebola treatment unit. So although we were getting an EMEDS, we knew how to work together to configure it to provide the resources and the type of services we needed to do. So before we even left the country, we started to meet together and reconfigure and see what we needed in the EMEDS unit or the ETU unit in country and what it was already capable of doing. So it required that collaborative spirit. It required the ability to think of what the mission was in country and what the purpose of it was. It required to think ahead, to plan strategically, to say, yes, we know the executive orders say one thing and we will do that. However, we will reconfigure it so we're ahead of the game when we get there. We will be able to make sure we have an, Ebola, an effective and efficient Ebola treatment unit. The leadership adapted, we configured it, and we stood up the first ever US government Ebola treatment unit. This is the first ever. It's also the first ever that's contained. All ETUs other than this one that I know of are open air. This one is contained. A lot of different challenges with that. For example, decontamination. You have so much liquid chlorine in a closed environment that may provide some new challenges that we don't know about. And we're experiencing them right now, actually, in the Ebola treatment unit. For those of you that are familiar with PAPRs, respirators, the filter on the respirator is not used to that much chlorine all at once, so the filters are, we're going through the filters faster than what's normal because there's so much chlorine in a closed environment. That's the disadvantage, we'd say, to a closed environment. The advantage of a closed environment, when you're in a country that temperature is very hot and humid, you have a temperature controlled environment. Very different to practice in a temperature controlled environment. And finally, we received input and re uh, on that last picture there, I hope I can get back. Uh, requested and received input from partners. So MSF were the first ones and IMC the first ones, WHO the first ones to step out and say, hey, 
we'll help you. First of all, we want to see this facility, we want to see what it's capable of. And second of all, we want to help you based on our expertise. It's not the normal way we always work with NGOs, but it's certainly in this mission, in this response, very collaborative. Proactively reaching out saying, hey, we'll help. So you see the MSF guys here who came in, and I could tell you one specific example. So when you have an internal facility like this, if you're in PPE, you're trained, your hands do not raise above your head. In the EMEDS unit, you can see the doorway right there where it, you roll up the plastic tarp, the plastic rubber tarp, and you string it up. It was too low, and you literally either have to duck or move your hand up to move it. We didn't know until we built the facility what that was gonna be like. We were trained appropriately, and we knew we had to cut the plastic and rubber up farther so we could roll it up even higher. So our tallest nurse, who we have a six foot five guy who's a nurse, he could get through this without taking his goggles off or taking his hood off. And he wouldn't have to duck and he wouldn't have to raise his hands up. So little things like that, you don't know until you build this facility on site and start to go through those infectious infection control protocols and procedures and actually start to work in PPE in the unit before you open. So little things like that we had to adjust. That's just one example, obviously there was more. So this is our MMU campus. Another thing we learned, another thing we learned is when that EMEDS unit was built, that's just part of the Ebola treatment unit campus. I call it a campus because there's multiple buildings all over the place. There's plumbing, there's septic systems, there's electricity, there's generators, there's different support outbuildings that are all part of an Ebola treatment unit campus, but not part of the EMEDS. So when the EMEDS was built, we were not done. We could not open at that point because we had no campus support and infrastructure. A couple of the buildings I could show you at the top, you could see a perimeter. So we had the gated fence all the way around the perimeter. You could see the generator. You could see the propane tank. I think it's propane. It's a fuel tank. You could see some of the outbuildings. You could see the food tent, which is green, the, cam the dark green in the middle there, right by the flag. You could see this outbuilding over here where the laundry services are. These buildings over here, latrines and showers for the patients. Although each set of patients has their own different set of showers. If you're suspect versus confirmed, you have your own showers. Over here on the left is family visitation. So you can see there's a six, there, there's actually a six uh, meter difference, actually about 18 feet, in between the two buildings. But they're mirror images. So the family in the cold zone can go outside the fence, come up and see the patients, see their loved ones through the family visitation windows. The windows mirror up. So we could have patients and family visit while they're there, obviously if they're ambulatory, which we have a lot of ambulatory patients actually. So another outbuilding. All this as part of the campus. When it was finally complete, a day after it was finally complete, we had the capacity to see a patient. So as I said, finding the calm waters. First thing I would say is assess the situation. Use an effective leadership style. So if you're in the lead of an organization, if you're in the lead of a team, if you're in the or lead of a unit specifically, or if you're one of us at the embassy coordinating with higher level folks, your singular leadership style is not gonna work in this environment. You have to have a situational leadership type of an approach. You have to have multiple leadership styles. Of course, diplomacy and collaboration is important, but you really do have to change your leadership style for each setting and each different interaction. Obviously, be prepared for challenges. We knew that there were gonna be challenges, but you have to expect that there's challenges. You will never know what they are until you get there. So expect the challenges, take care of the mission while you're there. Demonstrate resiliency, I talked about resiliency already. And finally, and the most important of all, build bridges. If we had not built bridges, if we had not realized that we were all there for the same purpose, it would be a lot different doing this mission. MSF could have stayed within their silo and say, you know what, we don't interact with these uniform guys, we're gonna just do our thing. If we were the DOD and they said, hey, these, these PHS guys, these blue uniforms, I don't know, I'm not too comfortable with them yet. They didn't have to reach out and support us like they do. We, the PHS, could have stayed in our and said, look, all we gotta do is provide direct patient care, so we're not gonna look at the bigger picture of what we can help in West Africa. We could have all done those things, and the mission would not have been successful. We are curbing the infection in Liberia. Obviously, you can see that by the numbers. There has been success. Our patients are doing very well. Right now, I can tell you we've seen 13 patients 
13 patients have been processed in our MMU. We have a 20% case fatality rate. The next lowest is 50%. Our case fatality rate is 20%. The two patients that passed on. Okay, you got it. I never thought I'd talk this long, but that's good. Got it. I'm on almost my last slide. How about that? I'm getting yanked. That's okay. So 20% uh, case fatality rate. The two patients that come in that did die where it came in in uh, severe progression of disease. Uh, really, there was nothing that could be done at the time that we had them. So looking for the calm waters, that was a picture one of our officers took um, of some calm waters. So uh, the coast of West Africa. Transcending strategic public health goals, this is the, you know, really what the U.S. Public Health Service can offer right now. If you think about the four areas of public health in the nation and globally, we have health reform, any national strategic priority, the President, Affordable Care Act, whatever it may be. Prevention in public health, the 50th anniversary of tobacco, reports out by the Surgeon General of the United States happen frequently. We put out that health education and communicate with the public. Global health, as you can see, our response in Ebola, our historical response, or polio, or smallpox and our health surge capacity, which is domestic. Some pictures, our first two discharges. This is why we're doing what we do. There's a sign that they, there's a, a board that they signed, today I am healed, tomorrow I return to heal others. This is the real reason why we do our work. He had an expecting wife, so he went back to his wife who was um, gonna have their first child. Rejoicing after his discharge papers, there are our first three discharges. My final two lessons, my final slide, in our PHS march, you have the DOD marches, all the, all the services. It says, in the silent war against disease, no truce is ever seen. I can tell you that's never more true than in this response. So the first thing is that I know that there's no truce against the silent war. There is no truce, but we're going to win this battle. We will stem the tide. And the second lesson I learned is our Corps stands ready. We are ready to do a mission like this. We are doing one, and we'll be stand ready in the future for another one. And that's all, folks. Sorry I took long. I appreciate your time. <laughs>